President Biden addressed the nation this week just after his shocking announcement on social media saying he was dropping out of the 2024 presidential race. I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. That's the best way to unite our nation. You know, there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life. But there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices. And that time and place is now. And now Vice President Kamala Harris has taken over the ticket with a renewed energy and monstrous momentum. So are you ready to get to work? Do we believe in freedom? Do we believe in opportunity? Do we believe in the promise of America? And are we willing to fight for it? And when we fight, we win. Top Democrats have rallied around the vice president, lining up to support Harris in her 2024 presidential ambitions. It's got the nation talking and reimagining what the next four years could look like at the White House. Republicans now have a completely new strategy to form. Former President Trump is the oldest presidential nominee on a ticket. And with Biden out of the picture, will the vice president bring a tougher than expected fight to the Trump campaign? This election could make history with Americans potentially voting in the first female president of the United States. It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, director of data science for Decision Desk HQ. Scott, let's jump right into it. A lot has changed this week, you know, just in the last 48 hours alone, we are seeing Democrats coalesce behind uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. It's been a complete 180 from where we were last Saturday and the week before. So do we have any possible polling on how uh, Vice President Harris fares against Trump in a general election? Yeah, we, we have some good polling, although most of the polling hasn't been taken after she's considered the presumptive nominee, which is important because that's a the different frame of mind for the voters. But what we do know is over the last month in hypothetical matchups nationally between her and Trump, she is two points behind. And that's a four point gain over the last month. She used to be six points behind. So as as uh, Joe Biden's candidacy has become a question and she's become more of a, a potential nominee, um, her numbers have risen. So, you know, this this completely resets the race. We're going to need to see a lot of new polling to see where this shakes out in some of the battleground states. So we know that before Harris was, you know, put to the top of the ticket after uh, President Biden dropped out, there were a number of these hypothetical polls that put her up against uh, former President Trump, but they were hypothetical as in when voters were, you know, responding to these polls, they were responding in, you know, a sense of if Harris were to become the nominee. Now that she's seen as the presumptive nominee, can we look back accurate at, accurately at those polls and sort of uh, take them, uh, you know, take them at their face value? Short answer is no, just because of the way voters look at at different candidates at different stages of of where they're at. You know, a lot of those voters, or a lot of the when those polls were taken, the voters were looking at her as a vice president. Now they're going to look at her in the lens of a potential presidential uh, candidate and and potential president. So. It, they're good reference points because, again, it's good data, but it's not data in the perspective and in the context that we're looking for. And that's kind of why, you know, it's frustrating. We've got to wait a couple of weeks to see see if some of this stuff changes. You know, like I said before, Democrats are completely re-energized with Vice President Harris taking the helm of the presidential ticket. In fact, a new CBS YouGov poll released this week found that 79 percent of Democrats support nominating Harris. What is her path to the nomination? You know, does it go through Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania like uh, President Biden's path? And in terms of the delegates, I mean, we know that she has secured enough to get the nomination. So what's the next step for her? Yeah, look, she this opens up a couple of different pathways that Joe Biden just didn't have at his uh, disposal. Obviously, the clearest one is through the upper Midwest, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. Um, you know, we're going to have to see if she puts Nevada and Arizona back into play. Now, they were under play under Joe Biden, but it wasn't trending his way. Um, and one wild card, you know, she's been talking about picking Governor Roy Cooper uh, out of North Carolina. Now, North Carolina about a, has been historically a, a Republican state, but back in the day, it used to be a battleground state. Um, if she's maybe picks a Roy Cooper and puts North Carolina in play, 
um, that that really opens some possibilities and puts uh, the Trump campaign on defense. She's also said to be considering Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, another major swing state. And Shapiro has proven time and again he's able to reach beyond the Democratic fold. So both of those governors, former prosecutors, former attorneys general, similar to Harris. So uh, those two will definitely be watching closely. I want to turn our attention to a recent New York Times Siena College poll that shows President, Vice President Harris is leading former President Trump in Virginia. Scott, I love talking about Virginia. I covered it in 2021 and it seems like it's been sort of a roller coaster ride there and you know I also cover Pennsylvania where we're seeing Harris is down just one percent do we have an idea of how she is polling in these other swing states and is this an overall a strong beginning to a presidential run we saw that it was a tighter race in Pennsylvania and Virginia between Trump and Biden yeah, no, this is this is a much stronger start. Um, and again, I'm going to link it to that CBS poll you just mentioned. Voters are a lot more enthusiastic about her candidacy than they were for Joe Biden. So I think you're going to see polls like you saw the one in Virginia where she's ahead, uh, you know, which is not not it's she's much further ahead than Joe Biden was. And it's, there were some polls that were showing um, uh, Trump closing pretty quickly. Um, I, I think what will be interesting to see in some of these battleground states is how long it sticks. She's getting almost like a post-nomination bump. Um, I'd like to see something out of Nevada, Arizona, um, even in Minnesota or Michigan. Uh, but these early ones, the ones you pointed out from The New York Times, they are a good reference point going forward. So prior to dropping out, we know that President Biden was struggling among black voters, particularly in Georgia. We know that he flipped Georgia in 2020, but it seems like that state has fallen closer into President Trump's uh, side of the court. How does Vice President Harris poll among African-American voters? We know that uh, the night that President Biden announced she was uh, going to replace him at the top of the ticket, there was a a phone call, I think, or a conference call with 44,000 black women calling in. It was sort of a, it was a, organized by a organizing group for, uh, you know, black female voters. So how does she do among that group? It seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, there certainly is, uh, there certainly is quite a bit of enthusiasm. We've seen it on the donations. We've seen it on calls like that. Um, you know, the African-American community is obviously something that she's cultivated over the years. Um, and, a, and a lot of her different campaigns in California. Um, it, it, it'll be interesting because Donald Trump in the cross tabs and, you know, in the cross tabs comes with a little bit of salt, um, has been getting between 10 and 15 percent of the African-American vote, which would be a, a sizable chunk for a GOP candidate. Um, if 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 VP Harris and her candidacy, she can get keep Trump under 10 percent. That would certainly be um, a big boon to her campaign um, and keep her in line um, with uh, keep her in line with past presidential campaigns. So assuming she becomes the Democratic nominee and she certainly appears to be on that path, do you think Trump's choice of Ohio Senator J.D. Vance could hurt Trump's campaign? Harris has long been President Biden's voice on abortion rights. We know that Vance has been a very vocal anti-abortion advocate uh, appealing to conservatives. So with this continuing to be a key issue for Democrats in particular, do you think the Trump campaign could expect to get hammered on that issue? I know that the RNC took it out of the platform and they've sort of been shying away from this issue, but does that help them at all? Yeah, look, J.D. Vance, if I if I had to guess, I think the Trump campaign had the convention happen a week earlier and they were going to the convention this week. Um, with what we know now, J.D. Vance would probably not be the vice presidential pick. It would have been more of a uh, Marco Rubio, Tim Scott, Doug Burgum, just some of these more bridge like candidates. J.D. Vance is great on the stump, great for, um, you know, rallying the, the hardcore Republican voters, um, but not necessarily expanding, it, especially in those issues you discussed. And if 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 Harris's campaign is able to make some of these social issues a thing, it's going to be a problem for the Trump campaign because Donald Trump says he doesn't like to necessarily talk about that. He says he's more moderate on these. That's not what J.D. Vance says. Um, and so I, I, I think it's it's not necessarily a huge liability, but I think if the Trump campaign could switch, they would, but they can't. So they're kind of stuck. Yeah, Democrats and Kamala Harris continuing to hammer Vance and Trump on Project 2025, this conservative governing agenda from the Heritage Foundation 
Trump and Vance distancing themselves from that agenda. So we'll see how that plays. One stronger issue for Republicans is immigration and the border. We know that Vice President Harris was given the role of border czar during the beginning of the Biden administration. And we know that uh, Trump has really reached into its, his toolbox to attack Democrats on this issue. How can we expect to see Republicans continue to seize on that issue now that Harris is at the top? Top of the ticket, and she was tasked in the beginning of the Biden administration with handling this issue. Yeah, look, that that is one angle the Trump campaign is really excited to go after, right? We know through all of our polling that immigration is a top three, if not top two, issue in every single battleground state, and certainly nationally. Um, and there is quite a bit of footage, coverage, and uh, 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 material for the Trump campaign to use about how how much of a disaster the border's been as well as early on in the in the uh, in, in Biden's presidency where she was in charge of it. It's in we know the border is going to be an issue this year. That that is that is that is certainly going to be a liability. Now, it'll be interesting to see how Harris attacks it in terms of, um, you know, either taking responsibility or saying it was the right move, especially as we see, you know, the border getting a little bit better as of late. You know, the voters tend to be riding the wave of a momentum of news and not necessarily um, uh, dwelling on the past. And right now the border is getting a little bit better. So it'll be interesting to see how bo both campaigns attack it. But that is certainly a, a, an area of policy liability. Staying with President Trump over the weekend, he took to Truth Social to attack Kamala Harris after she was announced as the top of the Democratic ticket in Biden's place. Uh, the former president called her, quote, dumb as rocks. Um, you know, this doesn't really seem like the political unifying message we heard being called for from both sides of the aisle. So do you think this is a sign that that, you know, very brief period of political unity following uh, former president, the assassination attempt against Trump, is that period, you know, in the rearview mirror now? Yeah, it certainly seems like it. Those late night tweets or truce or whatever, whatever we call them, uh, you know, those are back. I, I also found it interesting, you know, the two two major female opponents he's had this year, he's, he's kind of gone after their their intelligence, um, which, you know, he, he needs to win over these suburban middle class um, uh, women in some of these states to shore up his uh, shore up his coalition. So, I, look, it, the message was pretty strong last week, and now we're kind of back to more of the same. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.